Uh, continuing with reading Dallas Pimento Book 1, Bronco, beginning with this piece called The Age of Mammals. It wasn't understood clearly a hundred years ago just how the sandcasters digested the bottle caps, fingernail clippers, lug nuts, and other metal refuse that formed the bulk of their diet. But then, these mysterious creatures were virtually unknown then. Now, with the rise of the space age, hard-working scientists like Bud Shank are edging ever closer to a fully comprehensive theory of not only sandcasters, but of all things, including the human brain, that the status quo might be maintained indefinitely, and ultimately, ultimately all consciousness may be united and homogenized like milk. Remember the days when individual dairies had their own uniquely tasting milk? Bud Shank's friend Dimum asked him as the two shared a table in the break room at Panscott Laboratories. Horrible. Just horrible, Shank muttered. Never knew what you were going to get, Dimum leaned back in his chair. Back in my grandfather's time, as an example of just this kind of practice, there were hundreds of different breweries, each turning out its own unique beer. Shank had fin long finished his honey bun. He debated, debated purchasing another from the vending machine, even as he ran his finger over the interior of the sticky packaging and began sucking his finger clean. Now you've got only what? Three major breweries? Same thing with cars. Shank got up from the table, reached in his pants pocket, and pulled out a fistful of change. What are you going to get now? Dimum asked. Another honey bun. Another one. Yeah, Shank demanded to know what was wrong with that. Do you know how many calories are in each one? I don't want to know, Shank sighed, thrust his money back in his pocket, and forced himself to drink a big cup of water. I have a condition known as robot eyes. For many years, I had suspected that my vision was far better than the average person's, but I never knew exactly how much better until it, until it, was, uh, uh, better it was until I got my first look at high-definition TV. <clears throat> I had went to a store displaying one of the revolutionary new systems. A crowd was gathered around watching a specially formatted copy of Jurassic Park 3. It looks real, one man ye yelled out. I'm scared, a woman joked. Those, those dinosauruses look real. <clears throat> Don't it look just like you're looking through a window, a man I found myself standing beside said to me. It just looks like TV to me, I shrugged. Sure, the picture quality was superb, and Sam Neill had never looked better, but real? No, I didn't look real, nor as, as if I were looking through a window. Thank goodness, I thought. The last thing I needed was a technological nightmare of confusion of reality. I was still recovering from pot-induced paranoia, thank you very much. What do you mean, the man demanded. I mean, I don't see what's so great about it, I said. Sir, one of the costumes, costumed youths employed at the store addressed me. I'm afraid you'll have to leave the store. But why, I asked. I still have a purchase to make. Sir, please, don't force me to call security. What for, I said as I backed away, heading for the jazz section of the store. I'm just going to get a CD and be on my way. He's probably going to be going to get something old like Lawrence Welk, the man I had been standing beside called out as the employee spoke into a wristband bearing the store's logo. Security to high def display area boomed out over the PA. As the stocky young men muscled me down the aisle toward the exit, I cried out, I want my Kenny Dorham CD. <clears throat> I thought I faintly heard someone say, told you so, just before being thrust outside. It was a doctor who later gave me the diagnosis of robot eyes. You were lucky to get out of there in one piece, he told me after I had relayed to him the above events. People don't like it when others don't or can't appreciate the latest thing. You can say that again, I said. Why, is something wrong with your hearing? A pointless redaction in the pin frame ratio convinced Moult Manerly that he must make his dissatisfaction with the club known to the board of directors. At an appropriate hour, he rose from his chair in the depository and made his way to the board's suite of, office, suite of offices in the basement. He was shocked at how loud the TV in the lobby was. Can you concentrate with all this noise? Manerly asked the woman behind the desk. What noise? She betrayed her defensiveness over every aspect of the lobby's atmosphere. Never mind, Mannerly shook his head. I was wondering if I could see Mr. Thorpe. Have a seat and I'll check. She glared at him as she got up from her chair. Do you mind if I turn this down? Mannerly asked with his hand poised over the TV. I wish you wouldn't, she snapped. That's two items I have to complain about now, Mannerly said to himself. Boo the Rignity. The first collection of drawings by the cartoonist calling himself Boo the Ragus was called Boo the Rignity. Of course, sniffed Snad Willis, a critic. 
The centerpiece of the book was a large work inspired by Nadar's pantheon, in which hundreds of personalities from the world of literature and the arts were caricatured. I don't know whether to be relieved or insulted by the exclusion of my own image from the parade of luminaries, Willis wrote in his one-paragraph review of the book. Afraid to scratch. What went before was a baked potato of indolence compared to the surface, uh, surfeit of lethargy which now compelled the Romans to endow Hesculon and his band of mercenaries with plenipotentiary authority over the island territory of New Guam. Although others in my chosen field of study have suggested that it was not the fault of Sheed that Protein was forced to dance in his way, and indeed some, my old mentor Ambot among them, have gone so far as to put the onus of responsibility of the ultimate synthesis of Watcher and Watched upon Graviticus and his theaters, I have always maintained a measure of nostalgia about such demonization. We begin with a haircut. At an old-fashioned barber shop, it wasn't necessary to tip. There aren't any barber shops anymore. They're all, they're all, they've all been combined with beauty parlors. Even if you can find one, the people who work there have been so corrupted by beauty parlor practices that they too expect a tip. I hate the tip, especially for something like a simple haircut. I'm afraid not to tip because I'm afraid that if the hairstyling personnel get to know me as a non-tipper, I'll get my ear cut or, worse, a bad haircut. Getting my ear, ears trimmed back wouldn't be such a bad thing. I have bad childhood memories of the other children mocking my ears. I've spoken with my wife about gluing them back with super glue, but her immediate denunciation of the idea made me put the plan on hold. I skip our elm from barber to barber because I don't want them to get to know me too well. I never knew if I have tipped sufficiently or too much. If I get my hair cut by one particular person at a shop two or more consecutive times, then he begins to think of me as part of his property. I don't want that. The tip thing plays a part in my reluctance, but I also don't want some kind of relationship to develop. I don't want to have to remember what I said the last time or make anything more than the most shallow of small talk, which I hate doing as well, but I guess one has to maintain some baseline of civility. On the day my story begins, I had been somewhat nervously awaiting my next haircut for two weeks. I had given myself the shortest of all possible crew cuts with an electric trimmer at home roughly two months before, for reasons I won't go into now, although in the past I have done the same thing to avoid barbers altogether or to make a symbolic break with the past. Now my hair, despite little necessary trims at home over the weeks to keep it in a semblance of order, demanded the professional's touch. Had I the money, I would send my wife to cosmetology school and buy her the needed implements to cut my hair at home. But she would probably set up a shop there, and then I would have to deal with her customers and that rancid smell of perm solution. I'm going to get a haircut today, I told my wife. I suppose I expected some kind of analytic response or affirmation that my decision was the correct one, but all I got was okay. Did I want her to come with me? That was a tough one. I, want, I wanted her company in the car. I didn't want her criticism or less than enthusiastic acclaim of this result. I invited her along. She is my wife, after all, even if she doesn't understand my aesthetics. You see, in this world of monolithic sexiness, my aesthetic ideals are considered antiquated, if not downright anachronistic. The Kennedy administration and its milieu sum it up to my satisfaction. That car that JFK got shot in, that's my idea of a car. Concerning haircuts, it is not exactly to the late president that I turn for inspiration, but rather someone like Cary Grant as he was at that time. You add an Ivy League suit to that equation, and you have the sharpest of looks. All that to say that the haircut I was aiming for was bound to be too severe for my wife. Now, if I was to, to sport as classic Sean Cassidy do, affection and admiration would be mine. My wife and I arrived at the Weltschmerz barber shop at a good time. The three chairs were full, but there were only two old men online. I sat down and immediately took out the book I was reading, What Maisie Knew by Henry James. Elsa, my wife, scrounged up an old copy of National Geographic from the magazine strewn over the bench. Except for the women on duty and the unnecessarily audible radio tuned to the most banal of pop stations, the place reminded me of shops where I got my hair cut as a child. I climbed through a small hatch into a crawl space under the bench and made contact with the robotic overlords. Wriggled back to taper. Having no further use for coffee, I, Dallas Pimento, stepped into oncoming traffic and shared my haircut with the world. The lining of my jacket, documented with fat men recumbent on sofas, spilled open and bore me to the third nearest hospital. It had to be that way. Recuperating and talkative, I spoke with speak. 
How goes the world situation? I asked. I wished we were playing chess, but I hadn't the heart to impose myself on him. Worse and worse, he said. I have known Speak for 30 years. We grew up within 10, ten miles of each other. Both of his parents and both of my parents worked at the post office, and we attended the same private fundamental Christian school. We both wound up working for the post office ourselves and have screwed at least one woman in common. Obviously not at the same time. At least that should be obvious. I was reading about Napoleon II the other day, I began. Apparently just before he died of fistic amputaria, he wrote a book about his ill-fated campaign to conquer Lumpert's. The book was lost for years, but recently a young couple in Dalmatia bought a house, and while they were cleaning out the attic, they found a copy. Everybody is so lazy, Speak nodded. And everyone is convinced that he is the only one working hard, I added, wincing at the pain once again rising through my legs. Mm, that's a little too relevant. relative for me, Speak demurred. Don't get me wrong. How could anybody do that? The, there are lazy asses, but then again, maybe everything is relative. I put my hand over my eyes, my substitute for collapsing in tears when no tears would come. Later, under the influence of dreams of Sinatra, bicycles, cornbread, ambulatory fish heads, and gin rummy, I decided to abandon my pretense of identity and you to your fate. Not that I believe in fate, although as an advocate of the theory that there is no free will, I guess I really should. I guess it depends on whether one has control over one's dreams. But from here on out in this narrative, consider everything as dreams, but remember that I am dreaming them. The Man with the Sheep she only has one tit, confided the stranger, but it's a big one. Is that so, muttered Mr. Funebra as he walked the stranger to his car. Well, I'll be in touch, the stranger said as he opened the door to his car. He extended his hand, which Funebra took. Funebra nodded one time by way of goodbye, the farthest he was willing to go in response to the stranger's wave from inside the car. He did not watch the car as it moved down his long driveway. Another bust, Fienebra told his wife as he entered the house. He wasn't interested, Rebecca asked as she toweled off a plate. More than not interested, said Fienebra, dropping into a chair. He didn't know what was supposed to interest him. Rebecca started to make consoling remarks, but Fienebra didn't want to hear them. The subject was dropped. A few hours later, just as the two of them had sat down to supper, a car drove up to the house. They heard it crunching over the gravel, and Fienebra was at the window before it stopped. Is it the same man? Rebecca asked. No, different car, her husband answered. Different man, too. He added as the driver's door swung open and the tall man with a paunch stepped out. I'll see what he wants, he never said. By the time he was outside, the newcomer had done nothing more than close the door to his car. He stood looking about the place with his hands on his waist. Hello there, the man called out when he caught sight of Funebra. Hello, Funebra rep replied. Is it too late in the day for me to take a look at your sheep? The man asked. No, not at all, Funebra sm nearly smiled. Come on with me. He started walking towards the barn. My name's Bodrum, the man said, offering his hand in midst dried Earl Bodrum. I am Paul Funebra, Funebra said as they, as they shook. I know. I heard about you and your sheep from a buddy of mine named Franks. Said he came by here earlier today. That's right, he was here. Franks had been the previous visitor's name. What he said interested me. They had reached the barn. Funebra reached out for the door handle. Well, let's see what you think, he said. A single dim bulb hung down from the rafters illuminating the immediate area inside the door. Can you see all right or do you need me to open the big door? Funebra asked. I can see all right, said Bodrum, scanning the interior. The first stall here on the left, directed Funebra. He stood before the chest-high door and made a ch, -ch noise with his tongue behind his teeth. From the darkness at the rear of the stall came a response of movement. Oh, it is a big one, Bodrum commented. The lone sheep came forward and put its muzzle over the top of the half door. Its head was as big as a tr kitchen trash can. It stood taller than either Fenebra or Bodrum. The latter put out his hand and felt the animal's jowls. Fenebra could see immediately that here was a man who knew something about sheep. And fully mechanical, I see, said Bodrum. That's right, Fenebra affirmed. Man, I'd sure like to see him walk around. Haven't you got a light over this stall? No, but I can open the big door, Fenebra replied. Inside the house, Rebecca waited for her husband for five minutes. She wouldn't eat without him, so she decided to join him outside. When she reached the bar, Mr. Fenebra and Mr. Bodrum were discussing, discussing the terms of the sale. Oh, of course, I can't move her in my car, said Bodrum, but if you were willing to do deliver to my place, I'd be willing to pay a little extra. Fenebra didn't bother asking how much extra before he found out something else. Where do you live, he asked. About 20 miles from here. As the two men spoke, Rebecca, perhaps inspired by the thought of never seeing the sheep again, began thinking about her sister Ruth. 
She had lost touch with her almost three years before and had no idea where she was living. In fact, Ruth was living in Atlanta in a tiny mobile home set up inside an old warehouse near a railroad switching station yard. Her legs had been amputated to the knee and crudely fashioned regeneration fittings had been attached to the stumps. She was watching Holly Goliath, an old syndicated drama on the TV, when Seth DeMoom knocked on the door. Come in, Ruth called out, lowering the volume of the, on, with, on the TV with a remote control. DeMoom opened the door crack. Ruth, I have brought a colleague of mine along. Is it all right if he comes in also? He asked through the crack. Sure, said Ruth. She straightened herself up as much as she could in a few seconds and put a pleasant look on her face. Demoom was followed by Bud Shank into the unit. How are you doing today, Ruth? Demoom asked. I'm very well, Dr. Demoom. She smiled as she spoke. Ruth, this is Dr. Bud Shank. He works with me at the lab. I have been telling him about you and your condition, and he asked if he could meet you. Actually, I asked him, Demoom corrected himself. I think it may, he might be able to give me some insight into your treatment. Why, is something wrong? Ruth asked. Her eyes widened. Oh, nothing, the moon assured her. No, everything is proceeding quite nicely. It's that your, it's just that your treatment has historical implications. I'd like to, Dr. Shank to know what we're doing here. He looked at Shank for confirmation. Good morning, Ruth, Shank said cheerfully. It's nice to meet you at last. Good morning, Ruth answered. Watching old Holly Goliath, eh? Glan Shank glanced at the TV and asked. Yes, I used to watch that every day after school, he said with a wistful tone that seemed genuine. Then he bent over Ruth's mangled legs as the moon began to explain certain details of the regeneration fittings and their application in as technical terminology as possible to avoid the risk of Ruth catching on that all of this was most unorthodox and in truth highly suspect. As Shank listened, however, part of his mind wandered over his memories of the TV program. He was glad the sound was down, else he would surely remember, remember exactly which episode this was. It was bad enough that certain scenes and pieces of dialogue were already bubbling up from the depths of his mind. Holly Goliath concerned the adventures of a young woman who could transform from an average-sized female to one of eight feet in a matter of a few seconds of screen time. This ability helped her to help others and solve crimes as she traveled the country, seeking, seeking for the lost formula that would allow her to reclaim her place at the fictional, uh, fictitious National Academy of Dance. In seasons one and two, she had traveled in the VW Bug, but by the third and last, she had graduated to a custom van that held a mobile command center and living quarters. This last season was dismissed by many, including Bud Shank, not just because of the short change of vehicles and the addition of Holly's younger cousin Linda to the cast, uh, but because the writing became much sloppier and jokier, the plot sillier and more contrived. Still, thought Shank, the episode about the corrupt politician allowing the small town to be exposed to toxic waste that turned their children into mutants all for the sake of money had been a good one, and, and, it, and it had been in season three. As Shank and Demoom walked through the warehouse away from the mobile home, having said their goodbyes to Ruth, they discussed the case. Is that all she does? asked Shank. Watch TV all day? I have a private nurse come by every day at noon and wheel her around the warehouse, Demoom explains. Who pays for that? You? I'm the only one who can. This whole project is top secret and patently illegal. Not really. Ruth signed away certain rights without realizing it when she submitted herself to my care. Closer to home, how I hate that strip. I was readying myself for another weekend of painting and forced social interaction while I was surrounded or summoned emotionally by the Bronco. Hard to define, harder still to contact one of, of one's volition, the Bronco is a mythical embodiment of a certain confidence that comes over me. They say that some people can predict earthquakes by a strange tone that sounds in their ear. I hear, heard a tone as well from time to time, but not necessarily in conjunction with the arrival of the Bronco, and indeed not necessarily corresponding to anything at all. The point is that I have this thing called the Bronco, which doesn't really exist outside my own imagination, but stands for an otherworldly being or presence that is inexorably guiding me to triumph and glory before the snuffing out of the candle of my otherwise meaningless existence. How's your haircut, Elsa asked. I like it, I answered suspiciously. Still think you need to go to the hospital? We were eating breakfast together. The kids were at school and I had just gotten home from my night shift at the post office. That was just a joke, I said wearily.